the race is on, and Carlos Sainz claimed his first Formula One victory in a dramatic British Grand Prix on a day when Zhou Guan Yu escaped a horrendous start crash and protesters invaded the track. But did Ferrari make a mess of strategy, particularly with Charles Leclerc? I'm Ed Straw, and to answer that question and many more, we're joined by Scott Mitchell and Mark Hughes. Well, Mark, a lot to talk about today. Before we get on to it, I do have to ask about the condition of your shirt. Quite a large hole in the back, getting bigger during the day? Yeah, I just, I've picked the wrong shirt up from home, and it's just an old one. It's probably ready to be used as a, a car polishing shirt now. And um, yeah, I only noticed when I got to the track that it had a small hole in the back, which has now become a large hole. It's been a dramatic weekend for shirts because I started the weekend with a button missing from one of my shirts. So it's been pretty dramatic, as you can imagine. Scott Mitchell, all well in the world of shirts? Yeah, absolutely fine. It's all been uh, it's all been pretty smooth. Got some nice compliments from uh, the shirt I'm wearing today, but unfortunately describing the shirt doesn't really work well for, for podcast listeners. So um, let's uh, skip past that, shall we? Because we spent a bit too much time describing the um, inner... Uh, decoration mechanisms of my flat the other day so let's not bore the listeners too much we get on with the race and the big almighty shunt and the fantastic dice rather than your shirt exactly 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 that's definitely what we want to talk about and let's get on with the shunt so scott joe guan yu's huge accident at the start of the race that was triggered when the fast starting pierre gasly attempted to go between joe and george russell then found the gap closing thanks to the mercedes drifting to the left so that led to a red flag that lasted around 53 minutes joe's okay how much worse could that have been it could have been could have been a lot worse. It was a scary accident. You saw, we watched back uh, quite a few different uh, onboards while uh, obviously F1 was being very, very careful with not showing any replays on the world feed, but we were able to look back at some onboard shots. It's, um, it, on on the one hand, it's the good kind of dramatic crash because these crashes where the car goes like cartwheeling or barrel rolling, there's a lot of energy flying off the car. So that's good. It, it's taking it away from, the driver, you, you, the the scare, the really scary ones are the you know plowing into a barrier, sudden stop, that kind of thing. But where it could have been really bad, obviously we saw the roll hoop um, seems to have broken away uh, in the in the in the crash. The halo's done its job; it's protected the driver. The catch fencing did its job; it stopped the car going any further. But it's just one of those nasty crashes where there's there's so much energy involved still, and the the car's moving around in different places. It's hitting so many different things it really doesn't take much for you know something to pierce the side of the cockpit or get through the, the 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 halo the halo is absolutely fantastic it proved its its value in this crash and in the formula 2 crash uh, this weekend as well but it doesn't stop everything so it could have been it, it could have been a lot worse thankfully it wasn't and mark we saw the car go upside down through the gravel trap it sort of pitched up just before it got to the the barrier itself and so it sort of rolled over the barrier and came to rest behind the barrier but in front of the big debris fence that's the second time in recent times we've seen a car the wrong side of an armco barrier at least it went over it at slower speed rather than through it as roman grosjean did but that that's always worrying when the accident isn't properly contained isn't it yeah exactly i mean the gravel traps do a great job but they you know they've, they've uh, caused the right way up um and uh, when it's 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 sort of skating upside down like that. There's not much surface area in contact with the gravel, you know. So, um, and it's the the bit sticking out, i.e., the roll hoop is it, it, it's liable to dig in and flip the whole car, which is exactly what happened. Um, but uh, the yeah, the, the every every safety advance in recent years, whether it's to do with circuit advances or material advances or um, crash test advances or the halo and um, they all played their part in I don't know, the thankfully lucky escape exactly and the halo got a lot of praise joe himself was very positive uh, about it Omar Safnow, the team principal of alpine at the end of the race was talking to him he said well i didn't like the halo when it was first talked about i thought it wasn't a formula one car but how wrong i was but we don't know the full extent of the damage, they'll do some analysis on it. I tried to get Jerry Pujolar, their head of engineering, to to say if there if there was a failure of the the roll hoop structure. There's there's two structures there. It looked like there may have been, but we've not seen the car up close, so that'll be investigated. He wouldn't comment particularly on it. They're taking a very close look at it, but that that's probably the interesting thing. The FIA will study the accident, the way it happened, and the damage to the car. It's a thing that's often forgotten, isn't it, Scott? That the FIA do a ludicrous amount of research into this. Any major accident analyze it in depth it all goes into the database and that feeds future 
safety innovations, but a big tick for the halo, certainly. Yeah, absolutely. But the, the investigation will also go beyond just you know the safety mechanisms of the car itself. They they will probably look at things like how the how the car ended up vaulting that initial tire barrier. Um, there was uh, the catch fencing seemed to do its job absolutely brilliantly. It did obviously it ended up dented, but I don't. It, I saw some footage that some fans took of it afterwards. It didn't even look like the catch fencing broke at all. I think it literally just sort of gave way a little bit in terms of a dent. So I think the FAA is probably going to be quite happy with what they find. But the 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 beauty and brilliance of their safety drive tends to be that they're never really one hundred percent satisfied. There's always little things you can improve. That's what it's all about. Positive thing, Joe. Absolutely okay from that. Of course, a number of drivers involved in that accident. George Russell, who was involved in the initial clash, he got kind of tipped across into Joe as he moved across on on Gasly. So he stopped and uh, was trying to assist with the with the rescue. He jumped up onto the onto the barrier. There are a number of other drivers involved. Alex Alban got rear-ended by Vettel when the accident was happening as everyone concertinaed up, nosed into the pit wall, and he spun and wiped out Esteban Ocon. Yeah, it's the type of accident that just spawns lots of little accidents, isn't it? Exactly. Well, not so little for Alex Alban. He ended up going to the medical centre as well because he triggered the G sensor and off to Coventry Hospital to be checked over, but he's been released and is all fine, according to Williams. But a question from James Harvey, as always, members of the Race Members Club. Get to fire in their questions post-race, Mark. Thoughts on George Russell not being allowed to restart? He deserved driver of the day for his reaction to Joe's crash. Similar question from Mike Griggs about whether the rules should be changed if a driver goes to help the scene of a crash, because he could have restarted with the damage that he had was not particularly major, so it was repairable. Um, well, the car wouldn't... The, the car fired up, but it wouldn't move. Um, presumably some damage to the transmission from um, from the hit on the wheel. Um, so if he'd been able to get it around, yeah, but by the time he got back to it, it was on the back of a flatbed truck. Um, so, uh, yeah, it, I, mean, I don't think you can legislate for that. It's just unfortunate, you know, that, you know and, and, and uh, hats off to George for being more concerned about the, um, the well-being of one of his, um, one of his rivals rather than, uh, you know, just continuing on and, uh, leaving it to somebody else. But, um, yeah, it worked against him. He, he probably wouldn't have got it back around anyway. It's, it sounds like the transmission was uh, was broken. So, yeah. I think there was a slight misunderstanding about when George's car got taken away, wasn't there? Because I thought uh, a few people said that you know, he obviously went to check on Joe and it was after that, but it wasn't. No. He, he went to go and get help from the team, is that right, to, to try and get... And, and then he told the, the marshals, I'm... I'm Basically, I'm coming back. Went to the team to try to get some help. They gave, they got back there, and <laughs> and the car was gone. So it wasn't it wasn't explicitly going to check on Joe, was it? That and yeah, then coming back, that and that's when the car. There was an extra sort of step in between. Went to get the Haynes manual to see how you started it when this happened. And the bottom line is, you've got to be able to get back under your own steam to be allowed to restart. And a rule change was suggested. I think we might see quite a lot of drivers potentially slightly spuriously going to help people who've just had accidents if they feel they've got a bit of damage in the case of a red flag. So I think it's just one that George Russell has to take on the chin. And it was him moving over that played a big part in triggering the accident. So uh, it's a normal start accident. It happens. But uh, yeah, uh, sympathies for him but uh, at least he wasn't the one being fired over over the uh, barrier let's move on to the next thing which was happening at about the same time mark the police had issued a statement i think on thursday warning of a potential protest targeting the british grand prix and during the first lap of the race several protesters got onto the wellington strait that's from a group called just stop oil so a, a self-explanatory cause there f1 ceo stefano domenicali called them totally stupid and ridiculous, while both Lewis Hamilton and Sebastian Vettel expressed some sympathy for the environmental cause and the desire to protest, but were perhaps not so pro the, the method of protest. So where do you stand on this? Um, with Vettel and Hamilton, essentially, I, yeah, I, do, I respect the, the cause and um, I respect their efforts at uh, bringing attention to it, but it was an ill-advised way of doing it and they were probably rescued by the Russell accident because um, the cars are coming onto that straight at about 120 miles an hour and it's not just like uh, walking out into the into the road on a high street you know it's um, yeah it could have been horrific so um, uh, ill-advised campaign uh, well not a campaign but an ill-advised method yeah you can kind of understand the the desire to target an event like this and 
given what the cause is, etc. But yeah, the the consequences don't really bear thinking about it in that sort of instant. There was a question, Scott, from Oscar Robledo, who says, given that there was intelligence ahead of the meeting that indicated there would be an attempt to invade the track, was the security at the track appropriate? Um, I, I, I can't give a, a straight answer purely because I don't know the exact way the security changed, if it changed at all, whether it increased in number, whether it increased in uh, or, or changed in terms of how they structure their security. It's it's very difficult to know exactly how the police and the the circuit, because they obviously work very closely, will handle something like this. Because you can't you can't employ security to to look after every blade of grass around the Silverstone circuit. You, they'd have been looking at they've been trying to guard all of, all of the major entry entry points and that kind of thing. But I don't know exactly what what they did. But you know, if, if someone's going to you know run, jump, and quickly scale a fence, it, it's going to be difficult to do, especially when you do have gaps in between um, the positioning of uh, stewards and security and marshals, that kind of thing. So that will then naturally take time for people to react to protesters jumping fences and getting onto the track and, and, and that kind of thing. So the main thing is they just need to look into it very, very closely to understand how it happened, if they missed anything, and what they can improve for the future. Because the only people who will be able to answer Oscar's question properly are the police and Silverstone. And getting those answers is absolutely going to be imperative for when they do a little bit of a debrief. Well, it won't be a bit more than a little bit of one. It's, it's important that they do that because big sporting events like this are always targeted. And they, you've got to just be as absolutely stringent on security as you can be. Yeah, it's one of those things. What's the capacity here? Is it 123,000? That was the Saturday number, certainly. Big track, lots of people. You can't cover absolutely everybody. And because it's just a, an event where there's lots and lots of fans, how do you tell the difference between a fan and a protester until they started protesting and got into the, the wrong place? By definition, there was a failure in that the intention would have been to stop it happening. But it's whether it was a reasonable failure and whether there are any big holes in the, in the security. I'm sure there'll be plenty uh, plenty of analysis of it. Of course, it was here back in 2003. We had the track invasion, didn't we, down on, on Hangar Strait, which thankfully also didn't end, uh, end badly. But yeah, we'll, we'll hear more from that in the future, I bet, in terms of the, the investigation. And there were some arrests, weren't there, made of the, the protesters. So more to come on that in the future. Now, Mark, we can actually talk about the race. Obviously, we had that few moments of racing at the start. The grid was set based on basically what the grid was, but with the three absent cars, Joe, Alban and Russell, removed. That's because they didn't get to far enough around the lap to set a proper stable order. So it was effectively a new race, but it started on, what was it, lap three technically was the the, the first racing lap, I think, because it counted up from one lap completed when they, they came out of the pit. So obviously the big questions here are Ferrari's strategy. So can you take us through how the race played out and the key decisions that were made by the Ferrari pit wall that led to the result we had, which was Carlos Sainz's first Grand Prix win ahead of Sergio Perez. Mm. Well, the, the the first start, the one in which there was the accident, Max had chosen to start on softs and easily out-accelerated Sainz and looked like he was about to dis- disappear. But that would have pretty much guaranteed he would have been on a two-stop strategy to, to be starting on the softs because the range wasn't that big. Um, so it would have been Max on a two-stop, probably versus Sainz on a one-stop. But the Red Bull, certainly on Saturday morning form, looked to comfortably have had the pace to have won any straightforward race using either strategy. So I think what we're about to see, had it not been for the accident, was Max winning the race quite in quite a straightforward way, probably with a two-stop strategy. We didn't. The get, Red Bull was just the fastest car, wasn't it? Oh, yes, it? comfortably, yeah. Once, it, once they'd find Honda it um, oh, so Friday night into Saturday, because um, they brought a lot of updates here, and it, it had to be rebalanced, and but they, they nailed it on Saturday. It was oh, probably half a second faster than the Ferrari, and maybe six, six and a half tenths faster than the Mercedes. Um, the restart, um, Red Bull opted to go on the same tire as Ferrari. Um, they went for the medium, and this time, Science was able to pin them in. Um, well enough at the start that it compromised his line into Abbey and then Sainz then took the lead in quite committed fashion. But he was in a slower car. He's leading the race, but in a, in a slower car. And, and the more Max put the pressure on, the more he just opened. Be, Carlos began opening out the front left tyre and eventually ran wide and Max sailed past. And it looked at that point, yeah, 
we're going to have Max sailing off into a, a straightforward victory, but on the same strategy as the Ferrari. Um, but that only lasted a few corners because he then picked up a big chunk of Alpha Tauri from when Gasly and Sonoda had just collided. And that completely destroyed the Red Bull's floor. To such a, it was so bad he felt he had a puncture. He didn't. He came in and had the tyres replaced, but it was just as bad when he rejoined. And it was um, yeah, drastically lacking in grip. And that was that was Max's challenge over the day. I mean, he finished, but then and had a good dice with Mike, Mick Schumacher at the end. But the, that was that over. So it then became the two Ferraris versus Hamilton, um, and that that was a little bit awkward because. Leclerc, despite a little bit of wing damage, which um, incurred with uh, Sergio Perez on the first couple of corners, um, was clearly quicker than Sainz. Sainz had felt the car was great on Friday. Um, they made a few little tweaks to it, and he, he had understeer for the rest of the weekend, and he never had that edge and pace anymore. Leclerc was quite comfortable with his, and he was clearly faster, and team orders had to be issued in order to ease his passage because um, they had to do it because Hamilton was coming at them. Um, and then they, uh, they, the, the, uh, it was looking as though it was going to be a straightforward Leclerc victory at this point. Um, Sainz was still within you know, a couple of seconds, two or three seconds, um, but then he was told he was going to have to fuel save um, and it, it, with Lewis coming at him, uh, quite a rate of knots and having a fuel save it looked unlikely Sainz was going to be able to hold Lewis off and it was just a question of what could Lewis do once he got past Sainz about Leclerc I, you, that's unknown but I, I would imagine Leclerc, Leclerc had it covered he did have a, a good turn of speed the Mercedes was increasingly good as a stin went on it was very good on its tyres but it was very for the same reason it was very slow to switch its tyres on so it couldn't undercut the Ferrari, could only have overcut. And that's what they were going for. They were going for the overcut. Um, that all changed again with the safety car for Ocon's broken down Alpine. Um, Ferrari chose to bring Sainz rather than Leclerc in. Um, the reasoning, there was a certain logic to it. They, the fear was, and they only had, I think it was six seconds to decide. The fear was that if they brought Leclerc in, Hamilton would stay out, and Hamilton's tyres were only four laps old. And so the restart would have been Sainz on, uh, I think, 15 lap or 16 lap old tyres versus Hamilton on nearly new tyres um, with Leclerc behind them. And so that, almost certainly, Lewis would have been able to pounce and take the win off Sainz, and that would have been that. So that it was... The classic thing when you're leading, you have to make the choice and people then react with what you do. Um, but that decision was also based upon their estimation of, of the difference in the tyres. And we heard over the radio when Leclerc was questioning questioning it during his safety car, they give him the estimate. It was wildly out. It was way optimistic. They, 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 they hadn't realised just how good the soft was going to be. And how long it was it wasn't gonna degrade the way I thought it was, not not with a low fuel load and with the, the track grip rubbed up. Um so yeah I think uh I think they probably called that wrong. And they brought Sainz in instead, and so he was the one. Rather than Sainz being the one defending Leclerc's lead, he reasoned with them that that wasn't gonna work because they were going to come at the Hamilton was going to be coming at him on new tyres and he wasn't going to be able to do that. Well, that was the thing that puzzled me because I thought at the time leaving Leclerc out and Sainz bringing him in would make sense provided yeah. you use Sainz as that rear gunner to control the gaps to Leclerc. But obviously that would depend on Sainz having been willing to drop back and, and, and play that strategy. So that was the odd thing. It's like they committed to it and then they were happy to not do it, so which was just a little bit strange. I understand science's concerns, but yeah. it's just a little bit mishandled. Yeah, but he pointed out it was a much more certain way of winning the race to let him on the new tyres go past Leclerc and then have Leclerc defend his lead. And it was a much more certain way of winning, winning the team the race. And he, he, the, the logic was flawless. Um, but he'd been put into that position where he could make that case by Ferrari's initial call on who to bring in. Because they couldn't bring them both in because somebody would have had to be stacked or too close together. It, it summed up the way Ferrari handled this race that 
the key decision ended up having to be made by the driver. He, he, if if Carlos hadn't taken control in that situation, which, as you say, is absolutely the right thing to do, I think Ferrari would throw that race away. It was very similar to the situation in Monaco where he was instructing them, look, we need to get straight onto the... We need to stay out on the wet and get straight onto the, the slick and don't worry about the intermediate because we're, you know, that he had to guide them through that and it was a logical strategy and he had to do the same again here. And you can argue that that's the sign of a of a of a very good and switched on driver, and it and it is Carlos is is very good at reading these situations. It shows the confidence he feels, and also the hunger he has when he's chasing that first win. He's like, don't don't ask me to do this, guys. Let me have this. But again, I think it just shows the weakness within that within the Ferrari team when they really need to be decisive, when they need to be ruthless with with the calls when it's difficult with team orders or or however you want to phrase it. I just don't think Ferrari's sharp enough at the moment as a, as an operation. What I didn't like was even really early on when Leclerc was behind Sainz, Leclerc was quicker, even though he had that little bit of end plate damage. Only five points of downforce, but that's enough to make a, a difference. And I felt they should have switched then because it's not about which driver's ahead. It's about your race time. And they had Hamilton just behind. Gap was sort of five seconds, four and a half. It, it was just coming down. And I, I just felt that showed a desire almost for the situation to resolve itself. And we've seen this before. They're just, oh, we hope this goes away. And I find it really odd because they obviously want it to, to go that way. Leclerc's the championship shot. They'd be perfectly entitled to make that move. So that that was strange because that was completely self-inflicted, I thought. And what was stupid was once they actually gave, the first time they gave Carlos a firm order, which was, you need to hit this lap time, otherwise we're swapping the cars. Carlos said, give me one more lap. He did the lap. He didn't hit the lap time. Ferrari said, you've not done it, you need to move aside. And Carlos went, okay. So it was completely non-controversial. They could have done that about 20 laps before and it would not have been a problem. Yeah, exactly. And Mattia Bonanzo said after the race, he had absolutely no problem at all with the way Science conducted himself, said he was basically impeccable in the way he obeyed that team order, the way he had the dialogue with the team about not wanting to be the the, the, the kind of backing up at the field. So it was all done done correctly, which which was good. But yeah, not 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 an ideal situation for them. I agree with uh, Mattia on Carlos. Um, I disagree with Mattia's uh, staunch defence of his team's strategic calls in that race. I I understand why why uh, Ferrari perhaps are sort of protecting themselves a little bit, but the um, I wanted to give them the benefit of the doubt initially. I kind of agreed with you, Ed, about the the the, the point that if you know if they're making Carlos be the rear gunner, then maybe you can argue it makes a bit of sense. But ultimately, ultimately, what they did in that race was they looked at uh, their championship leader who had a hobbled car and said, "We're going to leave you to be the sitting duck." And I just think actually. I say in I say in hindsight because I was giving them the benefit of the doubt, but some of our colleagues were even calling in the moment that it was conservative and flawed and, and a bit stupid from Ferrari. And Matia can uh, is obviously defending it. I I don't really think he's um, he's got much grounds there. I think it was just poorly handled from Ferrari. Yeah, well, I think that's a, a fair point. Obviously, lots of questions about this. Mark Danny Elliott says Bonotto's finger-wagging to Charles Leclerc pre-podium ceremony looked serious. How did you read that after Leclerc's recent radio outbursts in previous races due to team orders? I believe he'd had a little telling off from the Ferrari headmaster. Yeah, I think he got told off probably for um, his... Um, his uh, on the slowdown lap, he was saying, you know, that we wasted so much race time there. Uh, you know, congratulations on... Carlos's win, but we miss, we wasted so much race time messing about. So he was highly critical, I think. Matteo was probably just saying, "You know, leave that stuff for uh, in the motorhome. Don't don't do, do that stuff over the radio." Yeah, that makes perfect sense. You've actually reminded me there was one other thing I didn't like in the team orders. That point when uh, Hamilton was was out front after uh, wait, awaiting his pit stop, and they were t- they were told that they were within Hamilton's pit window, but close to falling out of it. And they were told they were free to race and they started racing. You're like, no, don't do that. That's the last thing they needed to do. But that's just, that's another problem that, that sprung to mind. Scott, next question from Thomas Knights says, given the damage Leclerc had, was the pace differential between the two cars worrying today for Carlos Sainz? I, I don't think Carlos was um, was quite on Leclerc's level all, all weekend, really. I, I Mark and I were joking a, a little while before we started recording the podcast that, you know, Carlos has uh, scored pole position and won the race and he wasn't particularly quick this weekend in any conditions and he's managed to you know top qualifying in the wet win the race in the dry looks like a dominant weekend but it was anything but um I mean if you were going to be really generous you could say that you know sometimes if the if 
the if the car's balance is a little bit difficult, what was it, five points of downforce Leclerc was losing? Maybe that's not enough to completely unsettle the Ferrari balance. Maybe in real pure lap time terms, it wasn't worth that much. If it was worth only a tenth or two and Leclerc had seemed to have that as an edge over signs this weekend, it balanced it out slightly and then Leclerc was maybe a bit uh, kinder on his tyres. But yeah, it was. Um, I don't think it was so much of a worry for, for, for Carlos because he has... He has been quick this season. He has had races where he's been closer than this and not got the result. His priority after this is just the fact that he's won. We mustn't overlook that fact, must we? It was his first win, 150th start. That's an amazing number of starts from Carlos Sainz. It only feels like he's been around for a, a few seasons. Very difficult season. But although the circumstances you said did play their part, Scott, in terms of how qualifying and the race played out, we should say he was helped by Leclerc in qualifying, wasn't he? Because Leclerc had the spin, so that knocked Leclerc out of contention. And Verstappen hit a yellow flag. Verstappen would almost certainly have been on pole position had that not happened. So it's hard to begrudge Carlos Sainz some success, though, after the year he's had. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, Carlos is, um, well, first of all, he's one of the good guys in Formula One. I feel this is a, this is a really popular race winner. Um, so that's really good to see. He's so hardworking. And he has really kept kept his head down while, while things have been a bit been a bit difficult um he's he he hasn't uh, he hasn't let himself get um i think thrown off his stride too much either so he's been very diligent he has chipped away he has got a bit more competitive um he was so so close he felt to getting that first win in canada didn't quite have that traction off turn 10 in the hairpin and the straight line speed to get past max verstappen but he really felt that was proof that he was you know, knocking on the door of that first win. I don't imagine he really thought at any point this weekend, maybe even starting on pole position, it was going to come. But I'm um, I'm pleased for him. This is a sort of, uh, this is absolutely a, a, a maiden race win that I can enjoy on a personal level because as, as I say, Carlos is one of the good ones. Yeah, exactly. We've been saying he will win this season. <laughs> Obviously, the longer it goes on, the more you think, will it actually happen? There's one actually last question on the, on the Ferrari side of things before we finish talking about them, Mark. Ed Steiger says, do you think that today might actually help Leclerc a little bit more moving forward as far as team orders go? Might Ferrari feel less conflicted about asking Sainz to move aside if Leclerc is quicker now that the first victory for Sainz has been ticked off the list? Logically, that would you'd expect that to happen, but... Um... I, I still get the feeling that they would just as as they did in the previous era. They seem to handle problems like like you said before by hoping they go away rather than um, dealing with them. So uh, no, I, I'm not confident that that's what will happen. I, I think they'll just hope a situation like this doesn't arise again. Yeah, and it inevitably will, won't it? Because that's what happens. And there's lots of races uh, re- remaining this season. But it, it was such a shame for them, wasn't it, Scott? Because there was an open goal there potentially for Leclerc to win with Verstappen down, finish seventh in the end with his damage. So there was a chance it wouldn't exactly have transformed the championship picture, but would have made it at least look a little bit more like there was a chance for, for Leclerc. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it sort of, I think it says everything you need to know about Ferrari's race and the, the way they handled it, that they came away, they come away from this Grand Prix having chipped away at the drivers and constructors championship standings. And we sort of think that wasn't really a very good, result for them you know, in the grand scheme of things actually for I think Red Bull's probably the happier of the two with the damage limitation job that they did but I'm sure we'll come on to them shortly yeah it was funny wasn't it Bonotto when he was being harangued by people at the end of the race about did you get it wrong said well we got pole position and we won this is a glorious day <laughs> that's all that matters the details who cares exactly needless to say Ferrari had the last laugh perhaps not quite that much but Scott let's take a quick look before we continue at Progress and Grid Rival the fantasy motorsport game where the race has its own league 908 points for me Sebastian Vettel is my double points talent driver wasn't too bad given he came through to ninth but having both Alfa Romeo drivers and Max Verstappen didn't help my cause did I do enough to beat you? No you didn't I was uh, I'm still I'm only you know winking and blowing kisses at scoring a thousand points flirting with it rather than actually being able to make it happen so um, but that's a bit frustrating for me but it was it was a, it was a decent one um obviously i didn't get any points um i didn't even get style points for the way that uh, joe in, uh, left the race i brought him in for, for 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 this event i was actually feeling quite good about that after qualifying but it didn't it didn't quite play out but i had fernando alonso as my uh, talent driver uh, i had lewis hamilton in the team as well and i had kevin magnuson so i think they they combined quite nicely and i made uh, pretty reasonable progress i was quite happy 
Alonso, I think, was the best choice for talent driver because you can only choose certain price range drivers, can't you? So that was uh, that was a very, very good choice. It's also a very, very good week for the new leader in the races league with an excellent Spoonerism-based team name of Raniel Dicciardo, one of only two teams to clear 10,000 points so far in total. A bold decision to pick Mick Schumacher as the double points talent driver paid off in spades there. There's still time to join in the fun on Grid Rival, so sign up via the link in the show notes, either on the app or online. On race weekend, all eyes are on the driver. But behind every podium place, there's a team of off-track heroes working hard to power on-track success. As an official partner of the McLaren Formula 1 team, Smartsheet is showcasing how McLaren's off-track heroes drive success for their team. But Smartsheet's commitment to supporting off-track heroes doesn't end when the race season does. As champions and facilitators of powerful processes, the Smartsheet platform helps off-track heroes across the world put their teams in pole position every day of the year. Want to join the celebration and start powering your process? Visit Smartsheet.com today to get involved. There's obviously still quite a lot to talk about, Mark, up front with the, with the leading drivers. Let's talk about Mercedes first, though. They had another update this weekend. Lewis Hamilton looked quick all weekend. Perhaps there was a way for Hamilton to win this race as well. Didn't quite pay off, obviously, at the at the restart. Didn't quite go his way. But the car was quick, and the fact that the Mercedes could have won this race is saying a lot. Yeah, it's a much more Barcelona-like performance. As as we were expecting, it was, you know, the, the, the traits of the circuit... It's uh, fast and it's smooth, and that's that's what the car likes. So, um, but I think it was uh, probably made progress as well. I think the the, the update looks like it was a good one. Um, it's not quite; it wasn't quite on the Ferrari pace, and we just probably a hefty half a second or so off the Red Bull ultimately. I think, but it was very good in the race. It it, it, it looks after its tyres well, as we talked about earlier on, but for the same reason that it's it, it's reluctant to get them straight up to temperature. So that hurts it in qualifying. Um, so it, it's, a, it's a better race car than a qualifying car at the moment, although this was um, probably its, its its best showing of the season. And there's some great racing as well involving Lewis Hamilton, Sergio Perez and Charles Leclerc. How much did you enjoy that, Scott? The crowd on its feet for Hamilton when he uh, nicked places off both of them coming through club as those two were battling. Oh, it was a, it was a epic fight. There, was some, um, there were a couple of moments where I think uh, a, few, a couple of people cross the line in, in, in this race in terms of leaving space. But but that battle was, was so much fun, so intense. And there was also that moment where it looked like Alonso was going to uh, sneak into it and just have everyone. Um, my my favourite moment of the of, of the whole thing, though, was um, Le- Leclerc's around the outside move at Cops. And I even said that uh, to him when he, we spoke to him in, in the pen afterwards because he was, he was very, very downcast. And he, he wasn't really talking up his defensive drive or anything like that because it was failed heroics in in the end but I just said to him like can you just talk us through that because that that first glance we got it of it on the international uh on, on the world feed was a bit um it was a bit unclear it was like a wincing kind of moment because you see them go in and then it just it suddenly cuts to another shot and you don't know if they're both going to come out and then Leclerc emerges in front and he uh he did that was a brief moment where he had a big smile on his face I think he was proud of that one he did joke that he um had a little bit of a flashback to last year though when he was trying to hang on around the outside because obviously he uh him and him and Lewis got away with it last year, but um, Lewis and Max didn't, obviously, famously. But um, that was my that was my highlight, and I think even Leclerc, on reflection, even though the result went against him, looked on that quite fondly as well. Yeah, it was certainly some spectacular racing. Leclerc ended up fourth, Lewis Hamilton third, but still on Mercedes. Mark Andy Sally asks about the gains Mercedes made, the relative lack of porpoising, whether it is just track specific or if there's really big improvements there. Yeah, I think it's definitely track specific, but um, it's hard to know if there are also underlying gains. We won't really know that until we get. Um, I think I think it should be okay in Austria. Um, probably Hungary, which has got a few slow, co- yeah, quite a few slow corners and uh, it, it, it quite a, a, a rough surface. That that that'll be the the a much more of a test for the car, um, but it should go well. Paul Ricard, um, yeah, there's a few circuits left where it should show well, but I, I think it is still a bit of a one-trick pony car at the moment. 
you've half answered this question, which is very efficient from Mike Griggs, which is, do the Mercedes upgrades have the potential next week at the Red Bull Ring to gain a win? Probably a bit of a big ask from what you said. No, I think he is probably better suited to the car than uh, the Red Bull Ring. Um, Red Bull Ring's um, power and traction, really, and uh, I would say probably the Ferrari is logically um, very strong um, in those areas, uh, although... Let's see it up against the revised Red Bull again because the, that Red Bull was quicker than the Ferrari this weekend. So maybe it'll, it will be again next weekend. And speaking of the Red Bull drivers, Scott Max Verstappen, seventh place, hobbled car. It was a bit hungry last year, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. I, I, I drew that comparison with him and uh, and also uh, Christian Horner and they both agreed that sort of damage limitation, job well done. Um, obviously, very different kind of of damage to the car, similar effect. I feel like this one was actually a bit more dramatic, if anything, in terms of the handling characteristic whereas in Budapest last year I think the car was just really slow <laughs> whereas this seemed more of a handful to drive he did a good job um you come away from a race like this where you know look for a, a decent chunk of the middle of the Grand Prix looks like your title rival was on course to win and you're wondering if you can even hang on into the points and in the end Verstappen's only shipped I think six points to Leclerc um for for this one this is and, and obviously you got Sergio Perez as close to him in the championship, but I get the feeling that Max isn't particularly worried about him. I think his eye is on the Ferrari. Yeah, that would be absolutely logical. We should note that it wasn't a puncture that forced Verstappen into the pits. It was the uh, the, the damage. And yeah, just unfortunately, it was uh, Yuki Tsunoda's slightly uh, questionable move. Managed to damage three drivers from the Red Bull Stables race. But the one who wasn't affected by that was Sergio Perez. Mark, he had to have that front wing change early on. He was in the wars on the first laps. How how did it come to pass that he ended up in second ahead of a lot of these drivers we've been talking about? Yeah, he ran he ran very very long, um, and the the car was um, good on the tires, and he I think he did a thirty lap stint on um, a set of mediums, and uh, then he was rescued because that that gave him good progress. But then he, he made even more dramatic gains with the safety car because it meant that he's one and only true tyre change stop could be done under the safety car. Um, and that you know brought them right up the order. And because it switched its tyres on so well and because it's very strong in a straight line, it was it's a perfect restart car. Huh? And, you know, Perez is uh, very, very good at uh, pouncing and opportunities like that are presented to him and is tough and no-nonsense and uh, doesn't give any quarter. And, uh, yeah, he took on Hamilton and skied past him and then... Uh, he took a few goes to get past Leclerc and uh, did him too. Yeah, so it was a good day in the end for uh, Sergio Perez, even though it wasn't the, the best weekend overall. So he'd be very happy, I imagine, with a, a second place. There's a lot of stories in this race, so we're going to have to be quite selective and rattle through stuff. But can you just quickly explain, Mark, how Fernando Alonso beat Lando Norris to six? Because they were the other way around for most of the race, weren't they? Yeah, um, they, um, Alonso did the pit stop first and then... Uh, McLaren responded the very next lap. They got out with Norris still ahead, but on cold tyres, Alonso was able to get past, and that that was it, really. He was able to um, defend in any few key moments for the rest of the race, and uh, they were both sniffing around at the back of the uh, the Hamilton and Leclerc dice, um, but didn't have quite the pace to, to join it. I think it's good that Alonso got a, a decent result. It's obviously been a bit of a weird season for him. He's been performing well. He's had a few self-inflicted wounds as well on the way in terms of the old penalty. But yeah, a fifth place for Alonso and Alpine, well-deserved. And of course, Ocon would have backed that up, probably with seventh ahead of Verstappen if he hadn't had the fuel pump problem. Well, Scott, finally, this season, we can stop talking about Mick Schumacher being pointless as he finished eighth after passing Sebastian Vettel in the closing stages. How big's this breakthrough for him? Oh, it's very, very big. It will be confidence boosting. It's going to be a relief. Uh, it's going to um, relieve a lot of external pressure. It's going to kill a load of the annoying questions he's been asking. It's going to just diffuse any kind of tension that might have built up, even on a, in a small way within Haas, because I think I've had the impression, certainly from German media and just the, I think the way it's been talked about, that the Schumacher camp has been a little bit annoyed, perhaps with how Haas has sort of, handled his uh his mistakes earlier this year obviously we know the 
Gunter Steiner just hasn't minced his words, does he? So uh, unfortunately, Mick's been on the receiving end of some Steiner bluntness. Um, and I guess uh, the Schumacher camp has wanted a bit more of an arm around the shoulder at some times. But ultimately, Steiner and Schumacher have said this will happen. All he needs to do is keep driving sensibly, keep hitting the peaks that he has shown at times this year. Eventually, it will come. And it, and it finally did. And and he really, really deserved it. This This was a race that slowly came to him. And as it did... Uh, he he showed very, very good performance. He, rather than Kevin Magnussen, was Haas's leading light in this race and seemed to just have more pace pretty much from, from start to finish. And when the opportunity arose late on, a little bit of attrition, some uh, the safety car um, uh, as well, Mick took advantage of that and drove very, very sensibly. Um, I was a bit worried in that final, uh, final stint that having dropped down to 10th because he was in that sort of eighth place, pushing for, for pushing for Stappen. When he pit, I thought, oh, is this the way this points opportunity falls away from him? Because he's going to be have to overtake some other cars, there'll be some other cars behind him, is it going to go away? He handled that absolutely brilliantly, stayed calm. I think it was a mentality thing. He was on the offensive, chasing more points rather than defending the point that he had. And I also think he learned from his mistake in Miami where he got a little bit twitchy, got a little bit too eager, made that rash move on Sebastian Vettel, took them both out. When he got back up to eighth and was behind Verstappen in this race, Max wasn't. <laughs> Max looked like he was fighting for the world championship with the way he was driving against Mick. Mick, I think, learned a good lesson there with you know just how Max drives and very sensibly on the final lap, just backed out of it a couple of times, kept it on the road, got those points, fully deserved. I'm very happy for him. Yeah, absolutely. The last thing he needs to do was tangle with Verstappen at the end of the race, and Verstappen. He's an intelligent driver. He will have known what was at stake for Mick Schumacher as well. Schumacher was backed up with, by Kevin Magnussen in 10th place as well, so a double points finish for Haas. Magnussen decided to stay out under the safety car. Slightly regretted that, but still double points finish for them. Very, very good news. Let's talk about Nicholas Latifi, Mark. We haven't talked about him a huge amount this year. He was in the old specification, Williams, with Alex Albon driving the hugely upgraded version with dramatically different side pods, ended up destroying plenty of those new bits through no fault of his own, really. How did Latifi manage to hang around in the points for so long in that race before finishing 12th? Well, qualifying in Q3 was the, the the foundation of it, and he did a really good job in the changeable conditions. He put the he put the laps in when the track was at its quickest, and it's a tricky thing to do because you don't know in changeable conditions when the track is going to be at its quickest. So when do you use the, the full battery deployment, and when do you use it as a harvesting lap, and how much do you use of each? And he's, he, he did he did that part of the job really well. Um, so that got him into Q3. Um, he did uh, two good starts and um, hung on to the hung on to the back of the faster cars in the DRS train, and then yeah, eventually, obviously, it, it, it's on down to its its um, normal level. Uh, you know, the, uh, once the, everything played out, but uh, yeah, good job this weekend. But I'd say probably strongest weekend. Well, definitely the strongest of this season, um, but up there with um, maybe his best of last year. He did tweet after the race that he had a little bit of damage after the first stop from somewhere. So. That played a part. But once he was kind of out of that DRS train, he was always going to be in trouble. Did also have a change of chassis this weekend. He'd been lacking confidence before. He doesn't really know if that was behind it because he couldn't really compare it with the other car. So he said, well, Alex was a lot faster than me in high-speed corners, but he's been that all season. So I don't know if that's normal or upgrade, etc. So good for Latifi. You've answered half of this question, Mark. So I'll throw the second half to uh, to Scott from Chris Parrott, which is, is it too late for Latifi vis his F1 career? I think it probably is because I'm pretty sure that Williams has made its mind up to get rid of him. And it, it does look like they've been leaning towards Oscar Piastri getting him on loan from Alpine. It does look like Piastri's been closer and closer to that deal being done. That did seem to be sort of pushed back a little bit by Alpine this weekend. The suggestion is that this might not be resolved until after the summer break now because Piastri's future goes hand in hand with Alonso. So I guess if there's any chance at all that the expected Piastri to Williams deal doesn't materialise, that's the only thing that saves Latifi's F1 career because he's not getting assigned by anyone else at this stage. And if there's a vacancy for next year, genuinely, and Piastri's not going to fill it, then, you know, if Latifi perform like this every weekend to the end of the year, Williams might actually be quite inclined to keep him. Yeah, it's his 49th start, though, and these performances are relatively rare. So I don't think it's transformative. But as we said before, he's a good, sensible, intelligent kind of operator. So 
maybe he can build on this. He'll certainly be hoping so. He was due to get the upgrade in France, but the fact that <laughs> that's lots of those shiny new parts are lying in tatters, some of them probably still hanging around the vicinity of, <laughs> of Abbey Corner right now, it could be delayed. We'll see how Williams get on with that. But yeah, a, a decent day for him. In terms of other drivers, yeah, Valtteri Bottas retired. He was on course, possibly for points when he lost uh, he lost his upshift, so that forced him into retirement. Of course, Gasly retired with some some damage after he was given the black and orange flag following that that moment with uh, with Yuki Tsunoda. Anyone wants to defend Yuki Tsunoda for that moment when he lost it, trying to pass him? <laughs> the team certainly didn't want to. Penalty for Yuki Tsunoda, that seems absolutely fair. Well, <laughs> there's been so much to talk about. We'll try and rattle through a set of questions that will cover some of the final uh, points that we, we've not talked about. One we'll aim at you first, Scott. This is referencing the accident that happened when Dennis Hauger was forced onto the grass by Roy Nassani in Sunday's F2 race. Spun and was launched, hitting the top of the cockpit area of Nassani's car. Mike Meredith says, we saw another sausage curb-related accident in F2, which would undoubtedly have been infinitely worse if it wasn't for the halo, with Abby Eaton's accident where she broke her back last year and that horrible F3 accident at Monza a few years ago when Peroni got launched, I remember. How many more warnings are the FI going to ignore before someone gets killed, which could very well have happened this weekend? It is. I understand why it's a why it's a problem because it creates dramatic crashes and people see a very very obvious problem and a very obvious solution, which is to not have these curbs. If track limits were properly enforced and enforced consistently and enforced in a good way, we wouldn't need curbs like this because you you would because you you just wouldn't you wouldn't have to worry about them stopping people from cutting because you'd be enforcing it anyways. That's the fundamental problem here. I think that. I think that a sausage curb, the one of the arguments, I'm sure the FAA would make this up until the point they get, decide to get rid of them, the FAA would say that they're not designed to be hit. So don't hit them and you're not going to have any problems. But walls aren't decide, designed to be hit. And cars hit walls all the time and don't result in really, really frightening accidents that cause serious injury. Any time a car's launched airborne is a spectacular incident. So I just think one of these incidents is too many. So they should have been it should have been long, learned from a long time ago. The only thing I'd add is that it's not just sausage curbs that we need to have learn a lesson about from that crash. There are two other things. One is uh, driving standards. I've said this before: Formula Two, Formula Three. The driving standards have been poor this year. Definitely a decline on recent seasons. Um, and the other thing is, I'm very disappointed in the 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 way the stewards have handled that um, that accident. Nassani's got three points on his license and a five-place grid penalty for the next race for forcing a driver onto the grass at high speed heading into a tight braking zone. I I just think that's absolutely outrageous. I, as, as you say, the, circum- the the consequence of that crash could have been horrific. Without the halo, I think Nassani gets killed. Uh, it's, it's of the absolute utmost severity and I just don't think it's been treated that way with the way that they handled it in the penalty. Next question for you, Mark, from Thomas Knights, who says, is it worrying that the only time you really saw Ricardo this weekend was hitting Norris with a space hopper? Of course, that was part of the Sky Sports F1 fun uh, in the build-up to the weekend. He seemed to have no pace at all in the race. I'm hoping there was a reason for it, because if not, this might be a new low in a McLaren for him. 13th place for Ricardo. He was along the way off the pace all weekend, didn't have any convincing explanation for any of it, really. Um, yeah. I, I just get the sense that his heart's no longer in it now, and that uh, he's just seeing out his seeing out the season. I, I, it, I think this is the the least convincing um, I've I've seen him. It's it's quite sad to watch. Yeah, not the driver of old. Certainly, he did have a DRS problem. Couldn't use it late in the race, but. First stint was all right, but then once he was on the hard, it was just, just going nowhere in that, that race. And Norris showed what was possible in the car. Question for you, Scott, from Oscar Robledo. I think this is a topic you've been getting quite excited about a few moments ago. It says, what was the justification for Perez not getting a penalty unless he has been given one after the race? Well, he hasn't for leaving the track and passing Leclerc, but being passed by Hamilton. Uh, there isn't one. I don't think they've not had an explanation. Not had an explanation for a few incidents in that race with you know, drivers not leaving space on the exit. I just, I just don't know where we stand now with a load of the racing rules. They, they, they've they've issued this guidance for this year, which is, I think, broadly is if you've got half the car alongside at the apex, then you're entitled to be given racing room. But then, but we seem to have moved away from the precedent of the last two or three years, which was, you know, leave a car's width on the exit of the corner. Don't crowd someone to the edge. 
That happened three, four times in this race. Verstappen was guilty a couple of times. Perez did it to Hamilton. I just don't, I just don't know where we are at the moment and getting a straight answer seems to be impossible. Yeah, well, I won't weigh on this. I've said it many times over the past few years. It's all a little bit of a mess in terms of driving standards and track limits and all sorts of things, which uh, is far from ideal. Mark, a couple of questions I'm going to throw into one, which are related to the, the crash at the start. Guy from Wisconsin said this is the second consecutive year of a pretty big crash on the opening lap of the race. Seems like this race has been incredibly amped up. Are the drivers starting to respond to that by being overly aggressive? Are we pushing the bounds of hard racing? And the Question connected to that from Janis van der Waal says, we've seen some horrific crashes that ended safe and sound for everyone due to the halo. Do we see drivers taking more risks now? And he points out that if the halo wasn't there, we could have had several deaths in the past few years. Grosjean, Nissani, Joe today. Yeah, it's a difficult to answer definitively, isn't it? Because you don't know whether subconsciously the drivers are driving a bit more freely, feeling that they're sort of um, enclosed in protection very visibly. Um, but... I don't actually think so because it, like that accident today, wasn't the result of over aggression. It was just a misjudgment, and the, 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 those misjudgments would just happen. Then they're just part of racing. Um, so I, I, I really don't think so. But who knows? You, you, there may be a subconscious element to it. It's a difficult thing to measure, isn't it? Unfortunately. <laughs> uh, next question, Scott, is Danny Danielski, who said. Should the FIA look into taller barriers to prevent cars from going over them? Is there anything the FIA can learn from the Joe accident? I don't really know, to be honest, just purely because I'm not really sure like whether taller barriers in the majority of incidents are actually necessary, uh, how much they, they, they really help. Because uh, ultimately, uh, the crash like this, the, the problem wasn't car flying into barrier. It was a freak accident where the car ends up upside down, bounces up and down over the gravel, digs in, flips up and over. You got, I guess, you got to draw the line somewhere with the height of the barrier. Otherwise, you could keep, um, you could just keep adding it and adding it, and adding it. Ultimately, that's why the catch fencing's there. Is if the if the car does clear the barrier, then something does stop it. And so, it, the catch fence in the, um, the sort of supporting structure in this situation did its job. Yep. Next question, Mark from Leon Robinson, with Sebastian Vettel running his fabulous Williams FW14B on biofuel this weekend. Could it be a possibility in the future that F1 actually brings back V10s? Good podcast naming there. Um, I was kind of hoping they just let him race, or he just decided to race it. You know, like they would sometimes. Um, you could imagine them in NASCAR doing something sort of fake. <laughs> Very controversial, and just having Seb join in at the back and uh, and being shown the black flag and hearing this howling V10 over every other car on the on a circuit, it would have been quite fun. But uh, <laughs> yeah, it was it was very it was very nice to watch watching him do it, and he he was having a he was having a decent go. He wasn't just pootling around, and um, yeah, very evocative sight. If he had driven the race in that car, do you think he would have beaten Ricardo? <laughs> that's a very very good question but I'm sure you wouldn't have scored the points he did so that's uh, that's good for Aston Martin a few upgrades on the Aston Martin but not great pace from that car this weekend so it's been a bit of a sequence of races where it hasn't been brilliant for them haven't got the maximum out of it Monaco was good but there's performance in that car hopefully they'll be able to unlock it in the coming races and final question Scott from Kevin Prendergast aka KJ good to have an aka for one of our members does Pierre Gasly's tendency to place his car in vulnerable positions on lap one make him less attractive to top teams when you see people like Alonso gaining places and rarely getting into strife? Yeah, maybe not. Spe- maybe not specifically. And so, like McLaren probably hasn't looked at that and just gone, "Well, we would sign Pierre to replace Daniel, but it's his first laps every now and again he gets pincered, so we're not going to do that." But it's part of, I think, a makeup that makes him limited to being, you know, a, a good, sometimes very good midfield F1 driver just that lack of maybe awareness and precision that just holds him back sometimes. This isn't the first time. Um, I, I'm not saying he was to blame for the Joe crash today, but it's just, you know, what, what do you think you're achieving by putting your car in between this gap there? It's only going to close and the co- corner's going to go right, the car on the left's going to come across. You're, like, you're not going to win from, from from doing this. And yeah, he did it anyway. Yeah, there have been a few instances of that. Mugello 2020 was another one. remember him doing it there. Monza in the sprint race last year got caught out, didn't he? So it's just that little bit of racecraft uh, we talk about, maybe particularly when he's a bit down the grid, sometimes things go a little bit wrong. 
Well, as always, thanks to Scott and Mark and thanks to everyone for listening. Loads to talk about in today's race, so hopefully we've managed to do it justice. Head to therace.com and don't forget the hyphenas. There's loads to read there. And please do check out our sister podcast. There's a new series of Bring Back V10s coming up and our YouTube channel. As always, the pace is relentless in F1 and it's the Red Bull Ring next. So stay with us for everything you need to know about the Austrian Grand Prix. (laughs) 